The Sunday results are frankly bizarre, especially uh, the one in the middle of the game, uh, the middle of the day here when Port were too good for Hawthorne. It looked all day as if the Hawks were going to be uh, too good for Port, but Port ended up winning that game. Um, the game this evening, West Coast beat Melbourne, an upset there. That's not too far away. We'll dissect that with you, Jimmy and Lee. And then earlier on, of course, Essendon too good for North Melbourne. But as always, we start by looking at the ladder, Jimmy, and what are you, what's, what's uh, taking your fancy? Well, a lot of losses in, in the middle there at the moment where sides had opportunity to almost really get themselves in, into the top two or four. The Swans extend their lead on top of the ladder and it's all flying out of the hangar there. The Bombers <laughs> are into second spot. Look, the Kangaroos played some good footy in patches, but too much class in the end into second. And the Magpies, after a slow start this season, are just slowly coming up the ladder. And, Lee, the bottom well, eight. Yeah. Let's have a look at the bottom, mate. I still think the Bulldogs are a chance. I mean, you've got to get to 12 or 13 wins to just get in the finals. Top four's gone for these teams. And I think the Lions are still a chance to get your 12 or 13 wins. I think the Crows are now... A, that, uh, that loss yesterday probably put them really out of it. Three and a half is just not enough at this point of the year. And the other team, there, the Eagles look like they're going to be tough to beat in Perth, but uh, finals will be out of the question. All right, Lee, let's talk about West Coast and Melbourne at uh, Optus Stadium tonight. And the Eagles led... At every change, Harley Reid was a star. Take us through what happened and how, how the Eagles got this job done. Well, they, they jumped Melbourne from the very beginning, so they pretty much uh, led, led the whole, go whole game. But uh, they, they looked like some of the... I mean, certainly Reid and Gibney are sort of young guys who were coming through, but uh, they've got good players like Darling's back in form. He got his three goals today. We know at Waterman's doing up forward. McGovern down back and Barash is looking good. He not only kicked the goal, he can cast... Uh, he can cast, unfortunately, Jack Lever, who was out of the game from that uh, that point of the uh, of the match. Ben Brown got this goal, really, but the big Melbourne forwards were just they weren't in the in the cause really. Fritch was dangerous down there, but not the other big Melbourne guys. But Waterman, he's got to be the most improved player in the competition. What he's doing now, equal goal uh, uh, in the Coleman Mill. You wouldn't have bet, bet on that early in the season. And another five goals today. I mean, his marking is terribly, he's incredibly strong. Um, he's a very accurate kick for goal. So uh, he certainly was able to finish off their work. But what the Eagles did, really, they played Keeping's off with Melbourne to a degree. Now, this is Harley Reid. Just another few uh, things to put into his highlight reel. <laughs> just run, running away from Christian Pedraka. Two or three bounces and kicks the long goal. I mean, just outstanding, this, uh, this kid, really. And we know his balance strength, that ability to keep his balance and keep the... The, you know, the, a player of his age is just the, unbelievable. And that ability and this acceleration speed, and I call it balance strength, where he can keep his feet in all the contests. So they played keepings off a little bit with Melbourne. They held onto the ball until they could uh, blast it deep forward. And they got an 18 point lead at three quarter time. They didn't try to protect the lead because the best way to protect your lead is to keep the ball in your forward line. And that's what the Eagles did so well. And they drew a way to win by 35 points. Really impressive win today. Yeah, and they're fun and exciting to, to watch, Lead. And uh, we saw Jake Lever went off early with concussion, was subbed. And why that's important, it's only the fourth time in the last 101 games the Demons have given up 100 points in a game. And three of those four... Lever hasn't played. I'm counting the game where he subbed off, obviously, uh, today against the Eagles because he barely played any yeah. part. And you have a look at the numbers that Lee touched on. They mark the footy. They own territory. You know, nearly twice as many marks. But the scores from intercepts, it's normally the other way around. Melbourne's very good at setting up the ground. They get you on turnover. Melbourne got their score from stoppage. But 70 points for the Eagles. And it's the third time they've kicked 100 points. This is a side at the start of the year we're going... Oh, no, what do we do with the Eagles? At least when you're a fan of the Eagles, you get some fun, you get some excitement. They're trying to kick goals and really take it up to the opposition. So, Harley Reid, 21 disposals, two goals, 10 score involvements. Before we move on, are you concerned with Melbourne there next week with don't, no Jake Lever given he got concussed? Yeah, I think they've got such a good structure, but they're still going to find ways to actually keep uh, hitting the scoreboard. Now, uh, McAdam come in, Brown come into the side. It was their ball movement, but West Coast, if they didn't score uh, tonight... They locked it in. So they actually had very few opportunities forward of the footy, Melbourne. All right, Port Adelaide, uh, well, I say they were too good for the Hawks, really. They led for nine seconds in this game, and it ended up being a pretty important nine seconds with Darcy Byrne Jones, the hero. Mm. Talk us through how this played out, Jimmy. This was the Blake Hardwick show in, in the first quarter. He's gone forward, uh, obviously, at an underage forward, he was very good, but he's been playing back pretty much his career against the Hawks. He kicked four in the first quarter. This is Cam McKenzie, one of their many rising midfield forward, halfback talent types. They were dynamic, the Hawks. And the person keeping Port in the game, well, the two players in particular, 
was Horn Francis, who was trying to do everything he could. He was fantastic around the contest. They pushed him forward. He hit the scoreboard. And he finished the game with 23 and 2. But started to fade out as the game went on. But others certainly picked up the slack. There was a fair bit of rain throughout the game. Uh, Houston... Hawks will probably look back and go, we probably coughed up two, definitely, maybe three goals to Houston, just not paying attention. He wrapped around the back and he's a beautiful long kick from 50. But the last quarter, Port Adelaide just let down the sails and absolutely went for it. Two goals in the last quarter from Rioli and Darcy Byrne-Jones. And coming up in in a little bit, we'll see how actually Darcy Byrne-Jones kicks that miraculous goal uh, late in the game. So Rioli, what a finish. That's with 30 seconds to go. The 6-6-6 rule, all the new rules have been debated, but it actually played into the hands of Port Adelaide. They just couldn't keep the ball in there, the Hawks. Where you, If you could hold on to it and take a stoppage, at least you get the opportunity to smother the contest. So um, I think when we, we have a look at how that ball came into the forward line, we'll, we'll get to see where Burn Jones actually comes from to kick that winner off the ground. Well, let's have a look at how it did uh, take place, Jimmy. So, Willem Drew, fantastic hands in, in the conditions. And Butters, who I hadn't highlighted, had 17 touches in the last quarter. Yep. I've just highlighted, that's Darcy Burn Jones and Hardwick, who had to go back because Jeff went out. He's done the right thing. He just hasn't got the spoil far enough, but he's done the right thing. We mentioned there, Amon, if he can somehow just hang on to the footy and get to the ground, I know it's been really tough and critical. They did a lot right, Hawthorne, but just not enough right. All right, so this game was... Well, it felt like it was all but over. 23rd minute mark of the third quarter. Hawthorne led by 41 points. From then on, Port kicked 6-7 to nought goals 1. I want to have a listen to what both coaches said after the match. We play a lot of soccer. At training, sometimes people might think we play too much, but gee, we got a return today and a really, really important second. We, you know, it wasn't our plan to play in a defensive manner. We would have loved to continue to score and find a way, and that's our growth. I'm sure one of the learnings from the game. I haven't um, finished ruminating on it yet, but thinking about how we can find ways to score when we're in front, because the natural instinct is to is to tighten everything up and play conservatively. Yes, that is the natural instinct, and Hawthorne fell into that in that last quarter. They had 28 inside 50s, Port. Like, the game was played in the forward half, and I think when you're trying to protect the lead, there's this tendency, oh, we'll get an extra player back in defence. Well, as soon as you've got that extra player in defence, it almost guarantees the ball will be in that half of the field. So the game was played in in that half, and it was wet and slippery conditions, so it was hard to score, and there were still two goals in front, of course, with about 30 seconds to go. So Port only got them in the last little bit of the game. But either way, they only scored one behind in the final term. And when you, when you blow a big lead, it's usually because you stop scoring. And then the opposition, obviously, if they only needed to kick a goal or two, Hawthorne, and they weren't able to do that, they just went into this protect the lead, defensive mindset. You see it happen. I thought it happened a little bit with the Crows uh, in the very late in the game against Collingwood. You get in front late in the game, you just got to keep playing it. You got to keep playing. And Tom, Ollie Wines was subbed early in this game, and once we found the information why he was subbed, it was pretty scary. Yeah, heart palpitations was the official reason, and he's had issues with this before, Jimmy, in 2022. Look, the good news is Port Adelaide believe he'll be fine for next week. They believe it's not a risk for his long-term health, uh, but he did have to be taken off because the truth of the matter is that when he feels a certain way, he needs medication, and the medication takes an hour or two to kick in, and during a game, you can't do that. So he had to be taken off. There was some, uh, I guess, concerns that he might have to go to hospital tonight, but he's spending the night at home. He'll be checked throughout the week and he should be OK. Wow. Lee, um, let's talk about North Melbourne uh, and their loss to Essendon. The margin was 40 points this afternoon and North Melbourne gave it a crack for the first half, didn't they? Then Essendon was just too strong. Yeah, no, they were pretty solid. Uh, they were good in the clearances, Powell and Davis Uniac, and I thought Cherry probably had the better of goals to in the ruck, but that part of the game North were pretty good at. It always looked like that Essendon were better with ball in hand, but this is early in the game when uh, when North were really giving it a crack, and Davis Uniac, of course, snapped that goal, but he was really very good around the middle. Disputed. I think it hit the bottom of his foot probably on the way through, but it was Pink's first goal. And the, the coach liked it a lot. Yeah, of course, uh, what did you the gold well to you. Uh, he, he's played much better the last month than I think he did the first month of the year, which is one of the reasons why North are more competitive all of a sudden. They're still getting beaten, but they look like they're more, they're more competitive. But eventually the tall forwards for, uh, for Essen were a bit too good for them. Um, Wright uh, was, was good. He got his three goals and... Uh, Guelphie was, was good, but all in all, that part of the game, the North tall defenders is a bit of a problem area for them, I reckon, and Wright took advantage of that uh, 
of that today. But eventually they got away and won by six goals. I mean, that was a uh, eventually adjudicated on the uh, snicko, the whatever it's called, the edge, <laughs> that had touched the goalpost. Uh, but uh, a lot of the people were waiting to see uh, what happened. But uh, but they, they were pretty competitive north, I thought. But they had they got some holes in their game. But uh, but all in all, they, uh, Essendon, as we know, been, uh, don't know how they missed that one, but Essendon, they had to earn the six-goal win against a team that is yet to win a game. So I think north are a little, a little better today than I've seen them at any time this year. All right, let's have a listen to both coaches, Brad Scott and Alistair Clarkson, after the match. If we're going to be a good side, the good, the, the good sides continue to just, um, you know, just know when to go quick and when to, when to slow it down. Everyone's telling us that, that this should be a pretty easy game for you. And it's just not the case. Um, you know, have a look at Sheasel, have a look at Wardlaw. Have, look, these guys are, are, are very, very impressive players. They're the best juniors. So Brad's got fairly positive about North Melbourne there. They have conceded 100 points now, 10 matches in a row. They're bottom of the ladder. Jimmy, last week you spoke about the fact they need to find a stat that they can yes. hang their hat on. Have they found one? They did, and they won clearances by plus 13. And I like it. And Lee touched on Sherry had a, a pretty good game, and uh, the coach there of Essendon, Brad Scott, highlighted a couple of the young stars. And they're the guys who play around the ball. Davies Uniac played a good game, plus 14, actually, sorry. And nearly broke even in scores, uh, clearance from uh, differential. It's something to focus on and then build your game after that. I know Alistair Clarkson talked about when to go fast, when, when to go slow. Take care of the, the one metre and then build from the, uh, off that. What did you make of Alistair Clarkson on the bench, Lee? Well, I think it was important. Mate. I mentioned the tall defenders. Core was pretty good on, on Langford. Com Comden wasn't bad, but Will Dawson was playing his first game. And it seemed like every time Eston kicked a goal, he was the closest Eston player to the, uh, to the Eston taller forward. And he must have been really down in the dumps, as he would be. And he got off the field. The one advantage of coaching for the interchange bench, you don't get the big overview of the game, but you can actually cancel... And I think Alistair Clarkson made sure that Will Dawson, he was on his side to persevere, don't get discouraged. So I think, yeah, that's good. That's visible coaching. Uh, that's good to see. Did you have a coach from the bench, Lee? And would you recommend it for all young coaches in a developing team? I coached for the bench for one quarter way, way back when the phone uh, broke down in the coach's box. I walked onto the ground a quarter time and I wasn't sure what to say to the players. I had no <laughs> idea what was going on. So, no, you, I get, you get used to the ground-level view, I gather. But I, I always uh, like the elevated view. 